Welcome back. So now we have an idea of uh, this idea that we can use a little bit of bias in order to reduce the variance of our model. And we might end up with a model that has better properties. And specifically, it might be able to predict new things uh, more effectively. Today, we're going to talk about uh, one form of bias that we can introduce. And again, bias can be anything, but um, there's a specific set of types of bias that are going to be really commonly used because they have really nice properties. Today, the, the bias that we're going to talk about is uh, ridge regression. And so um, this is going to correspond to some particular assumptions we're going to make about um, the model that we want to build. And what these are are going to be that we want beta terms. So we want the parameters of our model to be something that's um, in a reasonable range. So for example, if we were building a model where we were predicting, say, heart disease, um, we might have inputs to that model. That's the age of the person and the weight of that person. And we'd expect that those are probably important inputs to that model. But we wouldn't expect those parameters to be extremely huge. We wouldn't expect to uh, maybe multiply age by a billion and then multiply weight by negative 100 million. And then the combination of that would give us a prediction for heart disease. We'd expect that we'd have parameters that are, um, you know, around single digits, say. And so um, one form of bias we might introduce is to make sure that our parameters are in a reasonable range. And to do that, what we're going to do is regularize our coefficients. And regularize is going to be equivalent to introducing some bias in order to give us um, a model with better properties. And the form we're going to introduce today is um, ridge regularization. And what this is going to be is we're going to have the exact same equation as we had with ordinary least squares, except we're going to limit this to um, limit our terms to be smaller than some value. And this is going to be equ completely equivalent to um, exactly what we saw with ordinary least squares, a different equation, again, with um, our beta terms being limited to be smaller than some value. Now, one thing that's going to be really important um, as we talk about this is that at this point, when we talk about ridge regression, we're going to take all of our input values and we're going to standardize them so that they have a mean of zero and unit variance. Um, and this is going to put inputs that are on really different units on the same scale so that we can compare them and not need to deal with the fact that they're on different um, units. And then our output is going to be centered. So the mean of all of our output values is going to be equal to zero. And we can very easily do this with our data by just subtracting off the mean and then converting it back after we're done. Okay, so um, this uh, limitation is going to be um, completely equivalent to us formulating this problem in a slightly different way. So rather than limiting our beta terms to be less than a particular value, what we can do is look back at the sum of squared error that we used before and add a penalty. And this is going to give us the same effect as limiting our beta terms to be smaller than some value. So you should recognize um, this portion of our sum of squared error uh, equation from ordinary least squares. And you'll notice that we just added on a little bit extra. And so we're going to call this the penalized residual sum of squared. So this is going to be the error terms in our models. We're going to square all of those and sum up those values. But then we're going to add this term that's going to add some amount to our sum of squared error. And you'll notice that this includes the beta terms directly. Ridge regression is often also called the L2 penalty because we're taking our beta terms and squaring them before we sum up all of those values. We also have this lambda value, and uh, we don't have a, a way yet of really determining what that value is. 
Um, but we can talk a little bit about what are, would be the effects of this lambda value. Um, so let's say that lambda was equal to zero. Simply what this would mean is that this um, term that we've added to our um, sum of squared error would just completely go away because anything times zero is going to be equal to zero. And what that means is if lambda is equal to zero, um, we're going to recover ordinary least squares. So we won't non no longer be performing ridge regression. We'll just have simplified this back to what we've seen before. Now let's say that lambda goes to infinity. The effect of this is going to be that we're going to start to um, make these the contribution of these this beta penalty bigger and bigger and bigger. And so eventually, all of our if we're minimizing the sum of squared error here, all our model is going to care about is making our beta terms as small as possible. And so we also can say what will happen if we set lambda equal to infinity. What will happen is all of our beta terms will be equal to zero. And the effect of that is that our model is going to um, just predict everything is an output of zero. Um, and so the, the effect of our lambda term here is going to be that when we have um, lambda equal to zero, we're going to have a really complicated model. So it's going to be equivalent to ordinary least squares. And so this is going to have higher variance. And then if we set lambda equal to infinity, we're just going to have a model that predicts everything is exactly equal to zero. So our model is going to have absolutely no variance, um, but it's going to have larger bias. So lambda is going to be this uh, term that we can change in our model. And changing the term is going to change the behavior of our model. And we can pick really any value of lambda. And we'll talk about how we can pick that later. Note that um, this one nice property of ridge regression is that the penalized residual sum of squares is still convex, which means it has a unique solution. And we're going to have a really direct and straightforward way of being able to calculate the answer. And so unlike nonlinear least squares, we're guaranteed to get the um, exact best answer. And we're going to have a very straightforward way of calculating that. One um, thing to note just in practice when using ridge regression is that some implementations of this are going to ask for a value of lambda. And some of them are going to ask for a value for 1 over lambda. And so you'll always want to check that because uh, you don't want to enter a large value because you want to penalize your model and then discover that you were doing exactly the opposite. Now we have this um, penalized uh, sum of squared error, and we're going to have, just like ordinary least squares, a way to directly can't calculate this answer. And we'll go through um, in a second. Uh, I'm going to show you um, exactly how we can calculate this or how we can prove um, this relationship. And the um, solution that we get is going to depend on how we pick this tuning parameter. And we'll come back to that in a bit. One really nice property of this is, in fact, um, including this lambda term, so uh, this penalty term, actually makes it possible to calculate solutions when we otherwise wouldn't be able to. So we talked about one of the limitations with ordinary least squares is if p is if p is greater than n, that our, we can't calculate a solution, that there's an infinite set of different models that would all perfectly fit our data. With Ridge, um, we actually can calculate a solution because um, our model will, will always be, the effect of this is that we'll always be able to invert this matrix that we um, calculate. And so um, one nice property of Ridge regression is we can use Ridge to build models when we have more variables than we have observations. Um, and this is a really nice property, especially nowadays when we have things like gene expression measurements where we can make many, many variables, but it can be difficult to get just as many um, observations. Um, and uh, this was actually the original motivation for ridge regression, um, was not to get a model with better prediction properties, but in fact be able to build a model at all when we have more 
variables than observations. In fact, the concept of ridge um, in other contexts is called something else, called Tikhonov um, regularization. Um, and it's used for exactly the same properties. And so if you're reading, say, um, a physics study, you may see reference to Tikhonov regularization. It's the exact same ideas as um, Ridge that we're seeing here. So let's come back to this equation um, and uh, just think a little bit about where this equation comes from. And I want to show a proof of this just so you have a feel for um, how the, the logic of ridge regression fits together. Okay, so we're going to start with our expression for the penalized sum of squared error. And if we take the derivative of this at the solution, we should be at a minimum of the sum of squared error. And so the derivative of this with respect to beta should be equal to zero. Now I'm just going to reorganize this a bit. So I've expanded and then moved one of the terms over. I've divided everything by two. I've moved another term over. And then I've separated out beta from the two terms. And then finally, I'm going to take this portion in the parentheses, and we can invert this to get a solution for beta. And so calculating the solution to ridge regression is really nothing more than some matrix calculus. And so this just shows that we can directly calculate an answer for ridge regression and get the optimal solution. So we don't have the same concerns as we had with nonlinear regression. So coming back to this lambda term, this is going to be one of the um, biggest challenges with ridge regression. Note that you're going to get a different solution for every value of lambda. And so as we vary lambda, we'll trace out a path of different solutions. And we don't have a particular lambda at this point that's going to be any better than any of the other ones. Lambda is going to control the size of the coefficients. So as it gets larger, we're going to have terms in beta that are smaller. And that's equivalent to saying that it controls the amount of regularization. This is just visually showing that. So as we vary the values of lambda, we see in this model that the weights on these different variables um, change. And this has uh, reorganized it in terms of degrees of freedom. And so um, on the left side here, this is equivalent to lambda being equal to infinity. And then on the right side, this is equivalent to lambda being equal to zero. We'll talk about in a second why uh, we might call the x-axis degrees of freedom. So what we're left with is we need to come up with a way of choosing the values of lambda. Um, and we need a disciplined way of doing that because um, we're adding in bias here. And so it's very clear that if we choose the wrong values of lambda, we're going to get a model that's not going to work as well. Um, and in fact, uh, the original um, scientist that proposed uh, ridge regression really um, didn't completely come up with the best way of doing this. So they, in fact, um, said, well, you should plot the the, how beta changes against different values of lambda. And then you should sort of pick where the terms stop changing in the middle, and that should be your best value of lambda. Um, and that, in practice, that's not really a, a principled way of coming up with a value for lambda. And it was heavily criticized at the time. Now we have some really good ways of being able to determine the values of lambda. And in fact, the next lecture, We'll talk about the correct way of doing this because it's going to be common for all the different forms of regularization that we use. One nice property of um, ridge regression is uh, that it's very simple for us to make some um, to reason about it. And um, one of the things that we can reason about 
is actually what a best solution is. And um, again, next lecture, we'll talk about something called cross-validation, which is going to be a better solution for doing this. But I think this nicely shows that ridge regression has some really nice properties. It makes it a simple model to reason about. So um, first, let's just say that uh, We're going to make a huge assumption and it's going to make it easy for us to say what the best value of lambda is so if our data is orthonormal meaning that all the variables are completely uncorrelated with one another so they're orthogonal to one another um, then we can actually directly say what the least squares solution is and you'll see next lecture that this is um, because in ordinary least squares that we have a direct way of being able to see what the cross-validation or the prediction error is. So if we assume this really big property, this is often not the case in practice, um, then when we, um, as we vary our lambda term in ridge regression, this is going to be equivalent to shrinking the values of beta. And so um, if we combine this with a property we'll see next lecture, then we can actually directly calculate what the best uh, lambda term is to make a model that gives us um, accurate predictions. So this is a nice property that because Ridge is so simple that we can directly calculate a best solution and do it efficiently. So to talk about the degrees of freedom, we're going to need to introduce this um, kind of unusual com um, concept. And, but I think this is a really nice um, idea to think about. And so um, let's just work through this and we can talk about what this means. So in order to talk about how a ridge regression reduces the degrees of freedom of a model, we need to introduce this concept of a smoother matrix. And what this is, and we can build something like this for really any linear model, it's going to be a matrix that represents the effect of our model. So if we take some input data and we fit to it, our model isn't going to fit that data perfectly. Um, and so a smoother matrix is going to be something that converts from our original data to our fit values. So let's think about this visually. So let's say we have a data set with X and Y, and we fit a linear model to this. The effect of this is that when we ask our model what its predictions are for these data points, the model is going to move these data points onto the line, because the model can only make predictions on the line. Um, and so a smoother matrix is going to represent this. If we plug in these data points, it's going to output um, these red values. So if we input these black points, it's going to output these red points. And that's going to be the effect of a smoother matrix. Um, and so it's roughly a summary of the behavior of our model. In ordinary least squares, our smoother matrix, um, we can actually say what this is. So we have an equation like this, and that's because our beta hat is equal to an equation that we know. So we know that y hat is equal to x beta hat, and we know that beta hat is this ztz inverted zty. And if you combine those, you'll get this, where um, our smoother matrix H is equal to um, a whole bunch of different Z's. And from linear algebra, we know that if the rank of uh, a matrix is equal to P, that the trace is equal to P, um, and that's the number of degrees of freedom in our model. So by analogy, um, we can say that the effective degrees of freedom of our model is equal to the trace of this smoother matrix. And that's why this idea ends up being useful. So in ridge regression, the fits are given by this equation we've seen before. The smoother matrix, um, just plugging things in, gives us 
this form. And then this, this allows us to say that the effective degrees of freedom in our model um, is equal to just the trace of this matrix. And that's equal to this equation where the lambda values are decreasing the degrees of freedom. And so um, this is why when we say that ridge regression allows us to get solutions when we otherwise wouldn't, it's in fact because ridge regression is decreasing the degrees of freedom in our model. Just a note, um, if you'd like to go back and check this for yourself, it's some um, linear algebra to follow through with. But one property you need for that is the following. Okay, so we have this um, useful form of regularization that introduces bias, but gives us a model potentially with better prediction. We still don't know how to pick our lambda terms. Um, and this will be a bigger problem of how we choose among different models to identify which one has better prediction value. Um, but we'll, we'll come back to that and solve that issue in a bit. And in fact, what we'll use to solve that is something called cross-validation. And we'll really dig into that next lecture. But if we're using cross-validation with ridge regression, we'll end up getting something like this, where we'll see that for, um, for large values of lambda, we end up with a larger error. And this is because of a lot of bias. And with small values of lambda, we'll end up with lots of error because of variance. But then in a, a middle spot, we'll end up with a solution where we actually are able to predict things effectively. And we'll be able to see that with cross-validation.